The pod racing scene is a VFX masterpiece. Phantom Menace gets a bad rap. For the longest time, it was viewed as a stain on the franchise, being slated for its boring plot, annoying characters, and bad CGI. With over 15 years of anticipation between the release of the last Star Wars film and this one, expectations were astronomically high, with some of the fans camping out for days just to be the first ones to see it. So, when they were met with an annoying CGI rabbit thing, it's safe to say they were disappointed. Which is a shame, because like many things in this film, the CGI was genuinely groundbreaking. As a VFX artist, an element of this film that I always found to be the most underrated is the pod racing scene. It may not seem like it nowadays, with modern VFX being able to create almost anything without limitation, but this scene was genuinely crazy to pull off. It needed amazing problem solving skills, which were combined with decades of practical effects experience, which was wrapped up in revolutionary visual effects techniques, which we still use today. From reading articles, books and interviews, and watching DVD commentaries and behind the scenes videos on the pod race, we can learn that everything in this scene was a new challenge for the VFX artists at Industrial Light and Magic. From the actual race to the crowd watching it, all of these elements have one issue or another that, unlike nowadays, the filmmakers couldn't immediately solve using CGI. Instead, they had to look to practical filming methods and figure out just how and where to film this scene. These issues all began with speed. Being a racing enthusiast, director George Lucas took inspiration from races in real life, such as NASCAR and F1, and wanted to capture both the speed and danger that these races presented, but also turn it up to 11 and give it that magical Star Wars touch. This meant that he wanted the pod races to be fast, really, really fast. Moving at over 600 miles an hour, the filmmakers found that the pod race would be impossible to film. Even using something like an aircraft or a helicopter to keep up with the pod races, the vehicle you're filming in would be so shaky at those speeds that the camera would never be steady enough to actually capture the action. Not to mention that having to bank or turn in a helicopter at that speed would be almost impossible and dangerous. Now, to clarify, they wouldn't actually be filming the pod races, because they don't exist. But what they would be filming is the necessary backgrounds to then add the pod races in later. Which brings us to the next problem. To contain a race where vehicles move as fast as pod races, you would need a genuinely massive environment. And you'd also need to find one which contains, or could be modified to contain, all of the awesome exotic terrain that the film's art department had concepted and designed. You'd need to find mushroom-shaped rocks, massive open spaces, and big fields of arches. As such, these issues really left the filmmakers with not much choice. If they were to actually film the scene, then they'd have to make real compromises with the scene speed, as by slowing down the pod races, they'd have much more choice of location, and filming them would be significantly easier. But this would mean the scene's quality would massively suffer, and it wasn't really a compromise they were willing to make. Therefore, the artists began to look for other methods to create and capture this speed, and found themselves using techniques they used over 15 years earlier in the original Star Wars trilogy. They decided to use miniatures. For those who don't know, miniatures are small-scale models of things like spaceships and monsters, which can be integrated into real-life footage as if they're at full scale. Their small sizes allow for much more control than if they were full scale, because they're so much easier to handle logistically. And back in the day, this is how a lot of special effects were done. So, for the smaller and more enclosed environments of the pod race, miniatures were the perfect option. Areas like Beggar's Canyon and parts of caves were a suitable size for miniature work. Small-scale versions of the pod races would have been filmed whizzing through equally small caves, as we see in the final film. In these small caves, the issues of the pod race's speed were largely disregarded. Because the scale of the caves is so much smaller than real life, the pod races didn't have to go anywhere near as fast, which really allowed the cameras to keep up with them. However, for the massive wide open areas, it was a whole different story. Because the camera was racing across the environment so quickly, the miniature sets would have to be absolutely huge to contain the race and maintain a believable horizon. If they built a miniature on the line of the horizon at the other side of the shot, within a few seconds, that miniature would now be right against the camera, because due to the pod racer's speed, the camera had already moved all the way to the horizon line. This meant that they would have to continually build another set of miniatures to further extend the horizon line again and again and again. This was such a nightmare logistically that miniatures had to be ruled out for these large open sections. The last option open to the VFX artists was using CGI, and it's one they'd already considered. But in 1999, creating a CGI version of the entire pod race landscape was a massive task. Having to have such a huge detailed landscape loaded into the computer and then having to calculate realistic lighting and shadows was much too computationally intense. The artist could pull off full CGI environments for smaller sets throughout the film, such as the battle on the plains of Naboo. But for the seemingly endless sets needed for the pod race, 
A full CGI set just wasn't possible. And this is where the artists at Industrial Light and Magic came up with a fantastic idea, one which would liberate them of both the speed and the scale issues. Firstly, they chose to build the scene's basic landscape using the standard CGI approach. This is building geometric shapes, detailing those shapes with textures, and then lighting them using computer-generated lights. To not make the landscape too computationally taxing, it would have just been very basic, just to provide the foundation of the scene. This is one of several reasons why the majority of the pod race's ground is just flat. Because in order to add more physical detail to the ground, you need to increase the quality of your geometric shapes. This puts more pressure on the computer, and thus puts further limits on what was possible for the pod race in 1999. So instead, the artist just added a detailed image to the ground, which in most shots is hidden by the speed and chaos of the race, but it's really noticeable in shots where the camera isn't moving. Because of these reasons, the landscape was bare, and of no real interest, so they had to find a way to pad out the CG landscape with elements that wouldn't be limited by computing power. And this was where the artists really started thinking outside of the box. So, when building a typical CG scene, you build your elements on the computer using a variety of digital 3D techniques. The elements could be made through modeling them, sculpting them, or sometimes even generating them through code. You can then use these elements to populate your scene, fill it with life, and then the process goes on from there. But this was not what they did with the pod race. Instead, they started by building their elements practically, by hand, in the real world. Essentially, they were using miniatures again, but with a twist. So, they began building miniatures and made them look as realistic as possible. Looking to the concept art, they made things like mushroom-shaped rocks and the fields of arches we see in the final movie. But they still only existed in the real world and were basically useless in a CG landscape. So the artists needed to find a way to get their new miniatures into the computer and subsequently into the CG landscape. The easiest way to achieve this is via a process known as photogrammetry. This is where you photograph something from all angles, feed those photographs into the computer and then allow the computer to reconstruct the real life element in digital 3D. Now, you have a digital geometric shape which matches the shape of your original object. By doing this, the artist now had their practical miniature and a completely identical digital version. But hang on, what was the benefit of using this method? If what you needed was a digital miniature, why not just build a digital miniature in the first place? Why go through all this hassle of creating a physical model and then scanning it into the computer? Well. Because the artist needed a computationally easier scene, they wanted their CG elements to have as little physical detail as possible. By using the photogrammetry method, they could have a low resolution geometric shape, but have it inherit all the little details from the photography projected across it. It's like what they used in the ground, but better. Why? Well, the photography projected across the CG elements was sourced from their identical, high quality miniature counterparts. Therefore, the projected photography had captured all of the same bumps, grooves, indents, shadows, highlights, and more from the miniature model, which, when projected across the low-resolution CG element, all fell into exactly the right places, giving the illusion of detail. All of these subtle details on everything you see are not coming from the geometric shape, but from the photographs projected across the geometric shape. Now, the artist could fill the scene with as many low-resolution, computationally easy, but realistic looking CG elements as they liked. Even more impressive was that the computer no longer needed to calculate realistic lighting and shadows for these elements because it was all coming from the photography projected across the model. This gave the artists a newfound freedom that solved so many of their issues. For example, speed was no longer an issue because the CGI environment had no limitations on how fast the camera could move. And using the new method, they can continually extend the set so you don't have to worry about maintaining the horizon or computing limitations. It also gave them a sandbox to work with. They could reframe certain shots, change the pod race's flight path, and create whole new shots because they had so much more control in the CG environment. It's an awesome approach to CGI, and one that I absolutely love, as it displays brilliant problem-solving ability in addition to blending both the practical and the CGI, giving the best of both worlds. It's a real shame that the prequel CGI is hated for being bad, as scenes like the pod race show real ingenuity whilst laying the foundation for the next 20 years of 3D work. There's just so much going on in this sequence, and while it may have its faults, it's very clearly lovingly crafted. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Do you agree with my thoughts on the pod race? What parts of Star Wars do you think look the best? And are there any other visual effects in TVs or movies you'd like me to take a look at? Please let me know in the comments below, and um, yeah, have a great day.